Hello, and welcome back to Break the Twitch. I'm your host, Anthony Ungaro, and this is an interview-based podcast on intentional living and practical lifestyle design. In each episode, I sit down with an amazing guest who shares their expertise and personal experiences in areas like removing distractions, building habits, and exploring creativity. In this episode, I share a conversation with my friend, John Polstra, a CPA turned change agent and certified professional co-active coach. This is a pretty vulnerable one for me, actually, because John was my personal coach for over a year and a half. We open up a lot about the things we worked on during that time and some of the mental tools we used to get through different challenges. In this episode, we discuss the difference between courage and commitment, the power of writing your personal narrative, and asking yourself better questions, the difference between being and doing, and how both can help you find clarity and take action in your life. If you've ever had the thought, there has to be more than this, then this episode will also be a helpful resource on your path. One quick note, we had some technical issues with the audio recorder on this episode, and we had to use audio from one of the cameras, which picked up a little bit of echo, but it still should be perfectly fine. It just may sound a little bit different from our usual episodes. This one is super valuable and absolutely worth a listen. We really wanted to get it out there, so here it is. Just wanted to give you a heads up. And finally, this podcast is made possible by the wonderful humans in our member community. If you enjoy our work here at Break the Twitch, we'd love to have you as one of those wonderful humans as well. Become a community member at breakthetwitch.com slash community and see all the fantastic benefits of joining. That's breakthetwitch.com slash community. Maybe hit pause and do that now because otherwise we're going to go ahead and start the show. John. Hello. How's it going? It's going well. <laughs> That's good. It's uh, a pleasure to have you here and quite the honor uh, because I think was it last time that we were together in person? It was on the bus. The bus. Yes. The, the awesome. Yeah. Welcome back to Portland. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, 2016 WDS or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, I was fortunate enough to sit on the bus next to you. And likewise. <laughs> so, so, we so we were at um, World Domination Summit in 2016 and we happen to be on this bus together, getting bused to the final party. And uh, we had the fortune of, of sitting next to each other and uh, ending up working together and all kinds of other stuff. So I'm really excited. And, and for me, this is a, a special chat because you were my coach for about a year and a half. That's right. And okay. so we're going to see what comes up. All right. All right. <laughs> You're going to kind of turn the tables on me. I'm really curious, kind of just off the bat, in terms of career and career changes and things. You started out in a very different place. This is true. From doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, tell me a little bit about what that was like in terms of starting out and where the transition really happened. Okay, there are several transitions. Mm. So uh, if we go back to the beginning, I was a computer science major in college and I had a very uh, emphatic accounting teacher that said that if you wanted to be a CEO, you needed to be a CPA. Hmm. So I changed my major from computer science to accounting, got an accounting degree. If you have an accounting degree, the next logical place is to get experience at a CPA firm. I spent some time at a large bank in Los Angeles, followed by a CPA firm. That, took, that was about four or five years of time. And I started, just, I did an IPO or two. I saw some quarterly SEC reporting. And I thought this isn't very fun. <laughs> I'm not really liking getting out of bed every morning. Um, so I changed within the public accounting firm that I was currently work that I was working for at the time, did some ERP consulting, which incidentally led me to spend some time in Minneapolis later. So fast forward, I left my job, went to Europe for a year and a half or so of traveling, working for a nonprofit. Uh, landed in Massachusetts. At what point in your life was the year in Europe? This is about five years into my career. So this is like 28, 29 years old of like, wait, this was supposed to be fun. It's not. Making money is great. 
but I'm not happy. As I was kind of becoming disillusioned with my career and where I was going, a friend of mine said, hey, you really ought to just get out of the United States, go to Europe, um, just step out of your normal everyday life. And so I did. Uh, if I hadn't done that, I probably would not have met my wife. I probably wouldn't have changed careers again. Just a number of things kind of came from that somewhat scary, but like pivotal decision. Like one of my favorite memories is sitting with the managing partner of the accounting firm that I was with in his office. And I was basically taking this massive leave of absence to go to Europe. And his, his exact words to me was, were, you realize this is going to leave a huge hole in your resume. <laughs> oh, that was not where I thought that was going to go. And for the first time in my life, I didn't, like, I cared, but I didn't. And I remember looking him straight in the eye and saying, yeah. Wow. And this is what I, and, and, and I, remember, I think his reply was something like, doesn't seem like I'm going to change your mind. I said, no. And it was like, it was a place of like fully like just centered, knowing I'm doing this. Is it scary? Absolutely. Do I have to do this? Absolutely. And it was kind of one of those moments, maybe we talked about this, which it, like later when people would say, oh, it was so courageous of you to, cr to quit your job. And I never thought of it as courage. I thought of it, it was more of like, I like this distinction between courage versus commitment. It was more that I was just committed to, like, something's got to change. And I got to change. I got to do something. So it's not like, it was scary, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't like this moment of, like, wow, I'm just going to be a courageous person. It's just like, I got to do something. So I did. It reminds me of the expression, feel the fear and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Courage often is fearful. Yes. I think. Yes. Yeah. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's, that's incredible. Uh, I'm always fascinated by those transition points that you see a clear loss and have a massive question mark in terms of what will be gained. Mm -hmm. And yet you've now looking back, you've seen a life partner perspective experience getting out mm -hmm. of the norm. So, yeah, long story short, I end up um, staying with this organization, but moving from Switzerland to Massachusetts, um, working there for a period of time, and then saying, you know what, I don't want to continue with this organization. I want to actually go into computers, hmm. which ironically was kind of where I started. And so I did a really intensive, at the time they had these, um, it, was like a, it was like a boot camp type thing where it was 40 hours a week for 10 weeks of system administration and programming. Mm -hmm. And so I did that program, ended up getting a job at EMC, big data storage company, headquartered in Massachusetts, testing software. Uh, that led to another job at Red Hat, a really large open source software company recently acquired by IBM. Somewhere in there at Red Hat, well, actually a couple points at Red Hat, where I kind of went through the same process again of like, I don't like this. This isn't satisfying. There's got to be more. There's always kind of, I guess, been this thing in the back of my head. That there's got to be more. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. This has to make sense. So like clarity and order, those are kind of my things, which kind of map nicely into coaching, which is helping people get clarity. As you were feeling those things, how did you land on coaching? I was meeting with a therapist here in Portland, a really good one. Um, and I remember asking him at one point, like, is there a therapist for your career? Because, you know, we're figuring out lots of stuff about my personal life, but my professional life needs like the same level of help. Is there such a thing? And he said, well, there's this lady I know that's a career coach. She might be able to help you. So I ended up working with her and she opened up like all kinds of possibilities and new ways of like looking at the world like that I could choose that I, that, um, that asking for people, like asking people for things that you need does not mean that you're imposing on them. It's that you're asking for what you need or what you want. Um, so that kind of started the ball rolling on like, wow, there's different possibilities for my career and what I want to do. 
And I thought I kind of wanted to continue with project management and maybe like have my own company doing that. That didn't work out. And then as the years went by, I was like, I just kept coming back to this coaching thing of like, wow, I had this experience where someone helped me find clarity and move forward. What if I got trained in this and helped other people do this? I took the first class through an organization I highly recommend called Coact the Coactive Training Institute. They recently changed their name from Coaches Training Institute. And so I was like, well, I'll just take the first class. And if it's really dumb, then I won't return. And it was completely life-changing. I remember the first class I went to, you walked in. I was expecting it as a hotel in Los Angeles. I was expecting like the banquet room tables with the plastic pictures of ice water, PowerPoint. You know, we were just going to like get some tips and tricks and maybe practice for five minutes and leave. Chairs are in a horseshoe. There's like a two-page handout for the three-day class. And within 20 minutes, you're coaching. Like you're practicing with a partner. You're talking. You're sharing. You're doing all kinds of stuff. And that class just totally blew up my mind. And then I'm like, I'm always kind of like a, a kind of a skeptic, kind of a foot dragger when it comes to... So even though I like did this Europe thing, like it took... It wasn't like one one night I was just like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to Europe. It was it was kind of, it happened in stages. So this was the same thing. It's understandable. I, I have a friend that made a PowerPoint presentation about his entrepreneurship journey to pitch to his wife. Uh -huh. to, you know, uh -huh. these, it takes a lot of planning. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. happens. And clarity, I bet some clarity came through that too. Mm -hmm. Part of the certification program was that you had to have 100 paid client hours. So this is not get a certificate on the internet Yes, anybody can call themselves a coach. I'm mostly okay with that. Getting the certification gave me like certain letters after my name, but I didn't really care about those. I didn't care about those then. It's kind of funny. I care about them a little bit more now because companies like large corporations are looking for some signs of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So those letters actually help me now. But I wanted to just go through this program to just get really good, the certification part of it, to get really good at coaching. So somewhere in there, I think we met... I thought we were going to talk about podcasting or something. And you're like, no, I'm interested in coaching. And yeah. yeah, the rest is history. It's funny how just things overlap, right? The the connections and the things. Because when we first met, I had no idea that that was going to be the <laughs> nature of our relationship at, at that point. Right. But I literally had had a conversation with Amy because we had just been diving. I'd been solo on the business and we had just been diving in to this stuff and, and growing break the twitch and, and doing these things and a lot of it was new and different it was new and different for our relationship our partnership our marriage and and um and so right at that moment literally not even a week before amy and i had had a discussion i was just like maybe i should like work with a coach <laughs> you know maybe i should just you know have someone outside of our partnership and or you know outside of friends uh, directly you know in the area here that that i can talk to that has a bit more of an ob objective perspective and and someone that wants to to do that then i think you posted on facebook and i saw that it's like john's awesome uh and while he's yes a friend i also think that his training in this would be awesome and it was it was super cool. So I just love how things sometimes just, sometimes you just see a sign, you see a thing and you go for it. And, right. and that was very cool. So your posting on Facebook worked. That program, the, like it pushed me in a number of different ways. Did I sit in, in my office and be like, how can I get the courage to post to Facebook? How can I, it was like, no, I'm like committed to finding these five people. Cause if you don't get your five clients, they kick you out of the program. So it was real. Like, so again, I was committed to that program. So it's like, I got to find these five people. And it's amazing how when you get really, really focused on how committed you are to something, you don't have time to think about how afraid you are. Or, or the other, another distinction I want to sneak in here too is um, how to versus want to. So often we get so focused on, I don't know how to do something, so I won't start. But if you get really clear on like, how much you want to or why you want to or how can I double down on wanting to, which again is just another way of saying commitment. All the answers are on the internet these days. It's that first step that gets a lot of us. And actually going back, something I wanted to mention was what you said earlier, which was, 
okay, I'll go to the first class, and if it's dumb, I'll, I won't go again. That's kind of brilliant. <laughs> like, How so? Because, because it gets you there for the first step. Yeah, I didn't commit to the whole five classes and the right. thousands of dollars. Yeah, I'll take the first class and I'll learn something. Mm-hmm. I'll learn that, like, I am the last person that should be a coach. Or I'll learn, wow, maybe I have some aptitude. Or I'll learn, like, these life coaches are all freaky. Like, I, I don't know if this is... So it's, yeah, it's, it's again, it's a, the filter or the, the perspective, I guess, mindset. I will forever remember my seventh grade science teacher. Always. Because in science class, we're doing an experiment with, I can't even remember what it was, but I'll never forget this. A student asked, well, what if nothing happens? No chemical reaction, no, no change. What if nothing happens? And he looked over and it just felt like the room went dark and the spotlight went on him. <laughs> and he goes, nothing is something. Whoa. <laughs> and I just remember my seventh grade brain just going, nothing is something. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes nothing substantial changes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's a result. I mean, that's, that's Mm -hmm. an outcome that you can learn from that, that, oh, okay. Right. (laughs) Take that and roll with it. What's another experiment that you've tried? I guess I've been trying to take this new approach to ideas, which is, can can an idea be an experiment? So when someone puts something forth, um, is it true? Or instead of just knee jerking, say that can't be true, or it must be false. Is there a possibility here? So a few years ago, I was listening to the life coach. I think it's the life coach school podcast with Brooke Castillo. And she was putting forth this idea that our thoughts create our feelings. And that it's just the simple thing that, you know, if you're feeling bad, it's your thinking. So just change your thinking, you have a choice, Uh, you can kind of go down the choice trail of like uh, victim mindset versus uh, owner mindset. So if you can kind of go both directions with this, how do I want to feel? Do I want to feel a certain way? What do I need to be thinking? So I'm going into this really difficult situation at work. I want to feel confident when I have this meeting with my boss. What do I need to be thinking about? What thoughts? If I can, now granted, I believe we can put thoughts in our head. I hold these two things in tension. I believe we can kind of put our thoughts in our head. And I also believe that our brain is just kind of like manufacturing thoughts all the time. Mm-hmm. And we can kind of look at those thoughts like a river. Like I was talking to someone recently and I, I just made this metaphor up or maybe I heard it somewhere. I said, what if, we, what if you're, what if you are a boat in the middle of a river and this river, like there's just water, this water flowing past the boat is just your thoughts. There's a bunch of trash like in this, that just flowed past you. Do you want to like overly identify with the trash that just flew, flowed through and just say, yeah, that's me. I'm the trash. Or do you just want to say, wow, interesting. Some trash just floated past my boat. Hmm. I think I'll steer my boat over into this other cove where the water is crystal clear. And you can actually drink it. Yeah, that's the water. Those are the thoughts that I want to choose. Conversely or related to that, I also think that we can often, and I've done this when I, in my saner moments, wow, I'm not having such a great day. Or I've got this, I'm just kind of walking around with this cloud of gloom over my head. What am I thinking? What have I been telling myself for the last hour? Not working hard enough. Haven't reached out to enough new people. Uh, If I don't do this any better or harder, I'm going to live in a van down by the river. Yeah, so anyway, the thoughts, feelings, mindset, experiments. Mm -hmm. I guess that's how I would tie all those together. In many ways, they are all one and the same. Our Mm -hmm. willingness to to experiment Mm -hmm. is our belief in our ability to and... Mm. potential outcomes, Mm -hmm. our our thoughts around the feelings, the things that we combine that that make these things possible and how we're living day to day. I I love the expression about how we feel is how we think or Mm -hmm. or around that. They're intimately connected. It is amazing. I'll catch myself going down that path sometimes 
especially when things are just overwhelming, even if I've gotten a lot of work done and it feels like things are on track and I'll just go, I still don't feel like I've gotten enough done today. I bet this other YouTuber probably has gotten way more done. <laughs> Why, you know, it, how is this possible? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how are people doing this so mm -hmm. well? And, and those are the types of things that I kind of recently have been sitting down this at least this is how I've been kind of coping with that sort of thing just sitting down and going okay like what's going on here you know mm -hmm. these thoughts not only are they not helping me at all but they're actually just making me not even pursue my best work right now I just need to like stop and just just breathe for a little bit here we're okay we're fine one of the things I remember us working on I think it was a sense of like, I have this belief that I don't finish things. I'm not a finisher. Mm -hmm. And in our work together, like, I don't remember what shifted it exactly, but I remember just coming to this, like, once you threw that belief away that you were not a finisher, that you were a finisher, like your book came out, like all kinds of things happened and shifted. Yes. There are many, many things that came as a, a result of us speaking regularly and working together. One of them is exactly that. And this happened to be going in tandem with a lot of things and the, the perspective really helped a lot because I did have that narrative. And what's funny is that I had that narrative because there was evidence of that narrative <laughs> in my previous life, right? right. I, I would, take on too many projects. I would have too many things going on and it would be too much. And thus I would be diving into so many different things. And, and then you have things that sort of fade off, don't get finished ideas, different things that start and didn't come to completion. And so in my brain, Oh, well, I just am not very good at finishing things. Of course this makes sense. This makes sense. Yeah, and I, I love see that, the evidence. I love it when I love that you called it a narrative, because that's the other so related to this idea that we can like choose our thoughts. I believe we can choose our narrative. We can choose our story. If if we're just gonna make stuff up, <laughs> like why not make up something good? Yeah. And so I feel like maybe it's been so it's been several years since we worked together, but I feel like maybe that's some of what we did. And I think that's how a coach can help and also an independent perspective which is to say, okay, you just created this really crappy story over here by putting like these four pieces together from high school or when you were in junior high or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is Anthony of today. This is the Anthony that I see. Mm -hmm. This is the Anthony that keeps telling me about all these people that he meets, that he knows that are either celebrities or well-connected <laughs> or what like, it was like amazing every time I, yeah, that was just one of the reoccurring things I remember too. You're like, <laughs> Yeah, I just I just met so and so, and they're running this massive company. Or yeah, I just I ran into, and they introduced me to this other person, and now I'm doing this. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, like, which story do we want to believe here? The guy that the universe continues to just like send all this gold to, or this guy that like never finishes anything? Like, which one do you want to live into? Yeah, there's a lot of choices around those narratives, and a lot of the time, I think part of what it was for me in that was believing that this was all just happening by accident. That, yeah. Oh, yeah. that I was making these, be but like, well, I'm just tripping into this stuff. And no, you told me you did this and you did this and you went on this trip and you had this connection and you followed all these things. That, exactly, that conversation uh, led to some blog posts about just feeling like the way I did things was not the right way to do things. Well, I was I often encouraging you to make your mess your message. Yes. Of like, here it is. And I also want to say too, I want to be super, super clear. Like, we, my experience is we can't do this on our own. And I fall into this and I'm working with a coach right now. And, you know, I was like, you know, because I'll get all up in my head. I'm like, I know my thoughts create my feelings and I'm having a really bad day and I just need to have, and he was just like, dude, this is real. <laughs> you're not having a good day. That's okay. Yeah. And what it took was another person to speak into my situation and to help me to kind of reorient. And so I guess what I'm, what I'm wanting to put out there is, yes, we may have these beliefs and philosophies that thoughts create feelings and all that. 
And sometimes our days are just bad and bad stuff happens and we can't just like mentally like walk ourselves back off the ledge. Right. Now, some people I know say, well, no, there are no problems. That's just a perspective too. Uh, that's a whole other rabbit trail. But yeah, I guess what I really want to acknowledge and, and say is like, this is real stuff. Mm -hmm. And I fall into it just as much as the next person. It is real. And, and the change during that time that came for me of simply that. So you pointed out this thing you, and there's other things too, obviously, but you pointed out this thing that was just like, well, it, you, if you keep saying this about yourself, right? You're just going to reaffirm this belief of this is who you are. And, and literally I shifted that, mm -hmm. that, that idea of going like that became a meditation for me. I'm, like, I'm a finisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way I, I tried to overcome my fear of public speaking or I did overcome it. I sat down and was like, I'm a great public speaker. I'm awesome. Mm -hmm. And I literally meditated on that. So similar philosophy, but I, I literally took that from you and held on to it. At the same time, we had the, the themes and streams of minimalism less, but better. Mm -hmm. And I saw this as a tool and these things coming back to the idea of all these things ha kind of overlapping and combining in life. Uh, all of these things happened. I go, well, I am a finisher. I just need to do fewer things. I need to do fewer things at the same time. Mm -hmm. I need to stick through when things get tough and see them through mm -hmm. and either say no more fading away. Like this is going to be a thing that I, intentionally choose that is not a good fit for me anymore or I'm going to finish it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is exactly what has happened. And well, and also asking better questions. Like what's coming to me here too is this idea of choosing what you want and then asking yourself better questions. So what would I need to do to be a finisher in this situation? Mm -hmm. That's situation specific, right? Yeah. Versus why do I never finish stuff? Because I'm stealing this from Tony Robbins. But it's this idea that our brain is a computer and we give it work to do. So if you give your brain the question of why do I suck? Your brain's like, well, John, let me give you, let me really work on that for the next hour. And like, I'm going to make you feel really good. Or it could be like, yeah, what, what would I need to do to be a finisher? The other thing, I, the other question, and this can be, I sometimes call this self-coaching. And it's kind of a coachy term, but I don't have anything better. But it's the idea of like, will this, how is this serving me or will this serve me? Yeah. So it could be a true fact that in junior high, you didn't finish that paper and you flunked the grade. I don't know if that's true. That might be true. But if you get to choose, on good days, I can ask myself that question. On other days, I need help. A friend of mine says, if you ask shitty questions, you're going to get shitty answers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. And it's true. Uh, even just the positioning of, of how we ask ourselves these, these things when we can, when we have the kind of mental clarity to, to step through. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about clarity specifically. One of the things that we did when we were working together was when we were feeling a certain way, changing the circumstance. So changing physical location, right? If I was kind of feeling stuck with writing. So moving to a different part of the house, mm -hmm. going to a different place, uh, getting up and walking around for a little bit. How has that come to you? And, and, and is that something you're practicing? And what have you seen from that? Part of that was my training countless times. With you, and in this case, we weren't doing video, we were just doing phone. Right. I'd be like, okay, Anthony, tell me where you are. And you'd be like, I'm in the living room. We had some topic, and you're like, what comes up for you around this topic when you're sitting in this space? And inevitably, you'd have a different answer in every single place you sat. And I've done it, I've done it with a bunch of people. It always creates magic. Um, in terms of how I use it myself, I don't use it as much as I would benefit from. I was going to say should. Like, through my training, like, I'm not one training session I had, or one coaching session I had, we were talking about empowerment and going into meetings, and um, my coach was like, so who's someone you really respect? And I was like, Jocko Willink. He's like this Navy SEAL. He has this book called Extreme Ownership. She's like, great. 
how would Jocko stand? So I like stood up and was like trying to, you know, me and my, <laughs> trying to like be this, you know, total jacked up seal. And then she's like, okay. And you know, how would he be? And so it was this idea of, so I stood up. So I'm not sitting like hunched over my desk. I'm like standing kind of like this A-frame stance. And it was like, so what do you feel in this space? I'm like, wow, power, groundedness. I started doing a lot of my coaching that way because I felt that I brought more presence and more energy. I was standing up and it's, I will get feedback occasionally from people on phone calls that I don't know. They're like, you're bringing such amazing energy to this call. And it's that I'm standing up at this standing desk that I created out of a rubber tub and an Ikea desktop. <laughs> it's like collapsible and it just goes under my desk or comes on top. Uh, so that's a way of playing with your, like, different places. Sometimes I'll sit in a different chair, move to a different room. How might you suggest someone try this for the first time? If, if they're feeling like they're in a funk or they want to try experimenting with this geography? Oh, just go sit in a different room. So if you normally sit in this one desk, like I would even, I would really mix it up too. Like sit in a weird place, sit in the bathtub without any water. One time I had someone, I was like, hey, it's really nice outside. And they were local. And I said, you want to, why don't we both go outside? So we both went outside. What's going on out here? Oh, it's different. There's, wow, there's a whole world out here. Yeah, how, what else? Anyway, so yeah, that's how, I guess I would just say it can be as small as like two or three feet and you'll feel something different. It's interesting because this is reflecting back to what you said earlier in the conversation about getting out of your routine, getting out of your world, right? In a big way, going to, to Europe for a year and really just, Mm -hmm. different things mm -hmm. or in small ways in in micro ways that that we can approach on a day-to-day -day level because one of the things that we do with uh, one of the programs that we have in the the member community one of the audio courses is a whole thing about like challenging assumptions and in the things that we we do every day and so one of the things is like don't open any doors with your dominant hand all day right or just do everything with your non-dominant hand all day, no matter what it is. And all of a sudden, every little single thing you do starts looking very different and new. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that's what it takes to really observe. Because I feel like our brain's always trying to make shortcuts. That's a twitch. I mean, that's a perfect, our, our brain is always trying to get that dopamine hit. It's trying to get to, from A to B as quickly as possible because that was a survival mechanism for us long, long, long time ago, right? Just automating those processes instead of like, well, I have to move this muscle to make my leg go up and then take a step, you know, we just walk. Mm -hmm. And and so a lot or as much as possible, we can move. We can go to a weird place where we wouldn't normally the dog bed, we on the floor or whatever, look up at the ceiling, do something different and, and it can be a powerful shift. Yeah, and I think the common theme in all of it is you're moving your body. Like, there's all kinds of science around this, but the, yeah, just, just sitting at your desk and trying to continue to think your way through to get to a better place, there's something about, like, moving your body, going to a different chair, going to a different country, um, and in a, in a slightly different way, there's, I guess there's this idea of embodiment, which is, I think, what I was trying to get to earlier, and maybe didn't say so, say as clearly as I would like which is we can think these things in our head, but until they really like become a part of us, and that was the other powerful part of my coaching training, it wasn't PowerPoint and tips and tricks. It was embodiment. It was, you will now coach this person and this other person will observe you coaching this other person for 10 minutes. Okay, that was, okay, you're done with the coaching client. What did you think of John's coaching? Eh, it was okay, but mm, not so good. Observer, what did you see John do? Well, John was kind of checked out and didn't really follow up. You know, she talked about this really deeply emotional thing and he completely avoided it. Ooh, okay, let me try that again. So in other words, it's the practice, it's the doing. It's the doing versus the being. And I think we probably talked about that too, which is taking action and doing things and then being, kind of knowledge versus action. Yes, so there are two things I want to go further on there. Okay. The, 
the being and the doing, which is something I had a note on because I really, that was a big takeaway from our work. And, and then what you said about embodiment. So through Break the Twitch language, to me, this is sounding like uh, a habit is an action and something you're doing in a small way, even if it's tiny, if you step outside and walk, you are a walker. You are embodying the idea yes. of walking. Yes. If you sit down and talk to a friend about walking, uh -huh. you're thinking about it. You're talking about it. You're, you're not doing anything. And so to me, am I correct in saying that kind of reflects the embodiment versus the thinking? Or what's your perspective on that? I keep coming back to embodiment because it was so powerful in my coaching training that I hadn't seen... I hadn't seen or experienced training in this way before. And it was so powerful because I saw it change me as a person. And I also saw it become a part of me in a way that I got it and I understood. Mm. So the ties back to the whole clarity thing, which was the whole reason I went to Europe. You, you mentioned also being and doing. Mm -hmm. Are those more or less the same? Or is that a kind of a different concept? often in like a coaching session say, you know, the real power comes from being and doing. So in this conversation, you have this really amazing insight. This, this new powerful idea is not going to become embodied if you don't do something. So I guess it's the idea that we tend, so my, I tend to lean on the being, love to have amazing thoughts, that first morning cup of coffee and like, oh, I'm, you know, oh, this is so great. The doing sometimes is more of a challenge. And so my, my, the, the thing to think about, I guess, for yourself is be like, am I more of a doer or a, a beer? And there's pros and cons to both. So now my wife and I are kind of opposites in this regard. She's a doer and I'm a beer. So for her, it's like, oh, maybe we should have a whole bunch of neighbors over for a barbecue. She's just going to like start texting people and be like, can you come to the barbecue? I'm going to be like, is this really the right night? Is this really a good idea? Do we have food? When are we going to go to the store? Our backyard's a disaster. Mm, maybe it's not a good idea. On the other hand, because she's such a doer, she's going to have a lot more barbecues that are like, well, the backyard never got clean, but we met all the neighbors. That was a really good thing for me. I remember early in our conversations, uh, several months probably. There was a lot of being on my part. There's a lot of philosophical discussion, <laughs> which I love. I, I love philosophizing mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. why I am how I am. <laughs> which why. is story, which can often become story. And we get in love with our story about who we are. And but yeah. No, yeah, totally. And, and the, the philosophy of it or, or the psychology of it, of, of just trying to think. And I would think, I remember, I would think of these things of, oh my gosh, this is the thing, and this is why this system will work, uh, and, and, and it'll click. And then I remember there was a transitional point in, in that timeline where the being and the doing, and that exact kind of thing came up, and it's like, okay, you can realize all of this stuff about yourself, and that's great, right? You can realize that this would work better if given this situation, but not until you balance that with the, the being, realizing, understanding, applying, doing, and not thinking about it too much. It reminds me of the system, the, the beehive. <laughs> we should talk about this too, right? Yeah, which can, yeah, it's so funny when you were, when you were reaching out to me and you're like, hey, you wanna meet up in Portland and do this thing? And I'm like, I happen to have all these post-its on the dining room. And I was like, look at this, I think I've got your system going on my dining room table. Yes. Yeah. So the beehive, this is something uh, that came up too. And, and this is uh, with our talk of systems. And I'd love to know how you feel about systems. Uh, for me, systems have been hit or miss. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I'll change them. I used Todoist or something. And, and the more and more and more different things I've tried, the more and more I personally have realized that the system does not matter quite as much as just whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it's Wonderlist or Todoist or Trello or whatever. Is you just have to consistent something that it has to be something that you consistently are willing to use and do and yeah. stick with and trust, right? Yeah, and I think well, I get two thoughts there. One, I guess I've learned to hold on to the systems loosely, mm. like 
this I have never found the end all be all system and I don't believe it exists. But I do work with people and they're like, John, I discovered like, have you heard of getting things done? <laughs> <laughs> Which always makes me shudder a little bit. But in other words, it's like I found this system, this is the solution I'm set for the rest of my life. Right. I've never seen that work. Mm -hmm. Yes, the and this is the what I love about actually the coaching is like I learned a ton of things from you. So as we're having this whole conversation, so I have this, yeah, for some reason, I think you went down to your basement, which again was movement. It wasn't us just like on the phone, just like, or Zoom, just staring at each other. And you're like, okay, I've got all this stuff in my whiteboard in the basement. I'm like, well, why don't you go there? Oh, okay, sure. So then I think it was the idea of, well, on this board are all my things, but I need somewhere to store them. And but yeah, it was this idea of what's a system I can come up with where I know nothing will get lost be able to trust it yeah then and, and that was your insight i remember you saying you're like i was like and again that's the power of this whole thing i was like well what needs to be important about that i'm making this up but i think that was i must have asked some amazing question like what's important about your system or what does your system need to do and one of the things came out was it can't fail it needs to be fail safe mm -hmm. and so i took away an insight from that i was like okay well my fail safe place is trello mm -hmm. and i rotate between trello post-it notes uh, I love copy paper, like just blank sheets of paper on a clipboard with colored pens. I would use a post-it for each thing that had to happen. What I loved about the post-its is I'd line them up like Trello. There can only be one thing in the top spot. And it was just post-it, post-it, post-it. And it was like, okay, these are the seven things that need to happen today. Mm -hmm. And I would get the first one done. And I'm just like, I can't do any more today. Okay, tomorrow, the actually the bottom one needs to be the top. And so I like that system. So to close on systems, I guess I would say... I ebb and flow between these mm -hmm. to looking in Trello. Trello is like, I know if I use the email to Trello thing. So if I'm, mm -hmm. I'll send an email of like, you know, talk to Anthony about when we're recording the podcast and it just ends up, there's a card at the top of the column. And then I just know that everything is there. For me, systems can be very helpful because one of my personal anxieties, probably one of the things, actually the biggest thing I would say that gives me anxiety is the thought of losing something. Mm. Uh, the thought of forgetting something, like like losing a thing that I was supposed to do, that kind of thing. And I think that's a, probably pretty common, especially in, in t today's sort of environment we, we have. And and so capturing the stuff, I think that's, a, you know, get things done. Which is, yeah, the total stealing from getting things yeah. done. And I think there are good things in getting things done. Sure. But the whole system of the weekly review and <laughs> it's like, I don't know how many re weekly reviews are on my calendar that never happened. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and so th there's obviously going to be pros and cons to all these things. But uh, the Beehive specifically for anyone that, that is curious about this and wants to try it, I, I really enjoyed it, really liked it in the house in Minneapolis that we no longer have. Um, I had this big whiteboard in the basement and I would use that whiteboard to essentially brain dump, to, to have post-it notes on it and some also some scribblings and lists and things. And it was a change of physical space and I, I really liked that. So the beehive was basically you, the the worker bee or the, the, the queen bee, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, however, yeah. It works. however you want to position yourself, I guess. Um, you go down into the hive, you see all the flurry of, of everything going on, you pick a thing, a post-it note, you take a list item, either wipe that one off the board, and then you take that one thing, you carry it back upstairs to your working area, and that is your task. That was the brilliant thing I thought about your system too, which was like one way that I help people reduce overwhelm is to dump it all, but then not have to look at it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was the thing. I remember, I, I feel like you, you were like, well, I'm just going to go downstairs and I'm going to pick up a couple post-its and that's all I'm working on today. Yeah. And that's, that's a tie in another thing, which I love is like defining success. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to define success today? Yeah. And you would be like, well, if I do these, if I practice the piano and mow my lawn and do these things and send out this thing, I had a successful day. Yeah. Done. Totally. And then you would do it. Then you would email me like, I did it. <laughs> and the hilarious part about that, this is a, was a major learning for me too, with the system and, and with everything else. It was that I always did better when I put fewer things on my list, actually got through the whole list, and then 
felt motivated to, wow, I'm really productive. What else can I tackle today? Instead of having this thing, I would just beat myself up with a to-do list yes. by putting eight, 12 things on there that probably weren't humanly possible to all get done. But because I was putting it on my to-do list for today, you know, just going to have to happen. And I would just so consistently come up short. And really how motivating is that? If every day you know you're not, you're literally not accomplishing what you set out for yourself, mm -hmm. you're just creating this narrative and a pattern yes. of being a person that doesn't get through their list. Yes. Yeah. You're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. yes. Yeah. And so that was a big change too. Now I take, three, if they're big things, two, three things, you know, for a day that, that I'm going to be working on and just focus on those things. And with the twitch too, with the idea of like distraction of, of, you know, social media pop-ups, all this stuff. We do our best work, we know, when we get into flow, when we get into a focused place where we can actually be zoned in on what we're doing. And and the ability to do that is determined by how many things we're trying to, we're thinking of at the same time and, and how many things we're allowing to, to capture our attention. And, and so the system in this way, also super helpful, just kind of, all right, there aren't eight things, there's one, mm -hmm. or there's two. And and you finish that one, you go down and get the next, and, and it's hard. We are conditioned uh, as humans, and, and all of the, our, our culture, I think, has tapped into take advantage of the fact that we are highly distractible thanks to our ancestry, you know, right? Well, I think there can be different, like, motivators, mm. too. Like, I'm on a, with this coach I'm working with, I've committed to him, that I will only read four books. Mm. In the eight or nine months that we're gonna to work together, no other books are allowed. So how how is four books different from what you might normally do? Shiny. Oh, James Clear has his new book on, on habits. Oh, you know, I've read a lot of books on habits, but I'm sure this one has like the secret key to the universe that I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. but, no, but like, how many books would you normally read during this period or buy or? acquire i'm not a huge book buyer but i'm a huge fan of the library i probably at any time have three to five to eight like in process oh someone just talked about this book i'm gonna go get it. like mm -hmm. so just constant um so it's the distraction it's a distraction factor kind of thing like social media and the notifications and all that but in, i guess what popped into mind as you're saying that is there's also something different here, which, well, it's, it's it's looking for a hit of something. And instead of a hit of dopamine, it's a hit of knowledge. This, this notion, and I guess this is something I'm really passionate about these days. There's this notion that like the smartest, most successful people read hundreds of books a year, or they read a hundred books a year. So the more, in other words, the more knowledge and the more books you can cram in your head, the smaller, smarter you'll be and the more successful you'll be. What I came across in a book recently, it was called Straight Line Leadership. Was a punch in the face. It was like, how much of the stuff are you reading? Or are you actually implementing, being, and doing? I was like, oh yeah, I'm on this massive like information consumption, shiny new knowledge. That's going to be the key. Oh, a new book on coaching. Yeah, I need to read that. It creates this like just fragmented kind of a, this is going to be the solution, or this is going to help me, or I just need to just cram one more thing into my head and. It's amazing to like step back from this. It's not to say that I have to read the same four books for the next 10 months. It's I'm consciously and intentionally, and I created a Google Doc for him the other day. I was like, I was sort of getting a little slippery. I found this other book that I got at this conference and I started and I'm kind of reading it now. And I'm like, okay, I got to come clean. Here are the, here's, here's what we agreed to. Here's the four that I'm reading right now. Here are some other ones that we've talked about that fit into the type of stuff we're working on right now. And here's a whole bunch of other books that I've heard about from other people that I'm just tracking and I'm doing nothing with. Mm. And the rule that I created was if I want to add another book, one has to come off the list. Mm. The one in So there can only be four in play, which I can bounce between. Like mm. straight line leadership is it's these short little chapters and they're, I call it my morning punch in the face. Like they're they're all like whoa, I need to think about this differently. I need to do this differently. 
But after reading that like so many days in a row, sometimes it just starts to feel like, oh my gosh, there's like so much to implement and do here. Maybe there's a parallel there of the thought that all this stuff will make us feel better. Mm. The thought that like all this knowledge is going to make me smarter, wiser, more rich or whatever. Sure. And, and it's funny you say, talk about minimalism and that is minimalism habits, creativity, you know, I'll break the twitch, the, the pillars I call them, but increasingly minimalism is becoming less important to me. And before someone takes a, <laughs> before someone takes that uh, sound bit and puts it on the news, I, I want to clarify and say that I've been learning to think of minimalism much more holistically as simply removing distractions. Because as soon as we pursue a title of being a minimalist or in this area, this, uh, certain things happen, I think, that are not necessarily as beneficial as removing distractions. So it becomes an identity. It becomes an identity all of a sudden. And I think that's okay. You can have that identity. I think minimalism is a powerful, wonderful thing that, that has helped me a great deal. But the majority of the work, removing physical possessions, removing dud projects, stopping taking every new shiny idea or saying yes to every single thing that someone proposes to me, has been simply the core of removing distractions so I can do more of what matters. Mm -hmm. And so that was always been the first step. So yeah, it, it is funny because I think most people that are naturally minimalists, and I'm doing air quotes for those listening, uh, you know, they maybe just have a certain philosophy around trying to focus on what matters to them, you know? <laughs> and, and so it, it, it's funny, the pursuit of titles, and that's all, maybe an entire podcast episode uh, on its own. But it's it's an interesting thing. So have you been in this experiment now for a bit with the four books? It's and been have you seen... since like July. So we're in September. Mm -hmm. It's been a couple months. And so another challenge I got was a, 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 with all coaching challenges, and we had these two, it was always you can, your uh, allowable responses were always yes, no, or something else. So his challenge to me was, I want you to have a day where you do nothing. No reading, no journaling, no reading, like whatever you do, just be, just be with yourself, be with your family. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> what does that even first look like? All, no. <laughs> I was like, well, at first I was like, tell me more. And he's like, I'm not telling you anymore about it. Like, you can accept it or not. Oh. I, was like, I was like, okay. Which I like that, I mean... Sometimes I kind of want to know that, and sometimes that, like, tell me more is just a, like, I don't want to do it. Like, it was, anyway, it was just, they had a very clear, like, no, there's nothing else to tell you about this. You can accept it or not. Nothing will bad will happen if you don't. Yeah. So what do you, and so I was like, mm, okay, I'm declining that challenge, but I'm going to experiment. I'm going to hold on to it. Okay. So I started playing with it. I was like, oh, okay, this Sunday afternoon, uh, for the next hour, nothing. I was kind of uncomfortable. But then I started having like creative thoughts and like, oh, maybe my son wants to go do something. Maybe I could, oh, the kitchen's kind of dirty. I think I'll just play in the kitchen. So it had all these other, and then we just recently got back from this massive road trip. We drove 6,700 miles in about 26 days. We went through Minnesota, Albert Lee. Wow, yeah. Just spent the night there and that was our, our experience in Minnesota. I'm pretty sure that's like the discount mall <laughs> center of the universe. I think uh, we stated the country and suites. Perfect. <laughs> it was a very nice place to spend the night. Um, the first week of this road trip, I didn't listen to any podcasts. I was barely reading. So I also had to disclose this, that I was reading The Count of Monte Cristo. I've heard that's a mm. classic, like classic literature, really good book. Anyway, so I was reading that, but I didn't even read it. So for the first four or five days, we mostly camped for the first part of our trip. All I did was drive and sit and look out the window and take naps in the car. Like, and it was amazing, like, how present to, like, what was going on. I think some of it was, like, detox, just shedding months and months of, like, doing and doing and doing. And it was just a lot of being. And I guess what I... I was more present to like my family and what was going on around me, I think I have more memories of this, like at least the first 
week of the trip than I do of a lot of trips. And it also like all the stuff going on in my head. We're in the middle of Wyoming. It's a hundred degrees. The transmission just shifted kind of funny. And there's no gas station or anyone for like the sign we just passed said no services for 50 miles. What would we do? Like all kinds of stuff was going on up in my mind. Um, and just being with it. Not having the like, well, let me just listen to a really interesting podcast or let me read it. Like there was no escape. I don't know. It was just kind of a purifying experience of just being with whatever was going on and just being present to everything, mm -hmm. even if it was unpleasant. That's a big one yeah. right there. Whatever you're doing, do it. Or whatever you're feeling, feel it. Yes. As opposed to, oh, shiny, uh... I'll just read this this book and feel better and escape this uncomfortable feeling that our car might break down. Mm -hmm. No, just like immerse yourself in the feeling that your car would break down. Yeah. And I'm and at the same time getting again what I was saying earlier, you know, I was like, oh my thoughts create my feelings. I need better thoughts. Like I'm trying to do it and it just didn't work. And so I asked myself a different question, which was, okay, if we really break down, what will I do? I thought, well, what have I done in the past? It's like, well, someone always comes. I have always, like, I've broken down before, not for a very long time, but I have broken down before and it has always turned out okay. There's nothing to say that this wouldn't turn out okay too. Mm. So, which is, an, to go down another tangent of this, like, um, something else I found really helpful, and I'm taking this from Michael Neal, uh, last name spelled N-E-I-L-L, -L, who's in this whole three principles thing. Mm. But he had this thing in this thing I was watching and, and he said, are you okay in this moment? Yeah, I'm great. I'm talking to Anthony. Will you be okay 24 hours from now? And okay uh, could be in the context of this road trip or sometimes it's, you know, running my own business. It's like the money thing. It's like, how's the money? Is the money going to be okay? Mm -hmm. It's like, and so, so like looking at this through the perspective of money, will I be okay today? Am I okay now? Yep. Will I be okay in a month? Yeah. Will I be okay in six months? Well, if nothing happens between now and six months, <laughs> ooh, things could be a little dicey. I don't know. It's not a year from now. It's not six months from now. It's so it's this whole idea of the, the like that has really helped me to be like, wait a minute, things are great, right? In this moment, we're having this conversation. This afternoon, I got a few things planned. Those are going to be pretty good, too. Tomorrow? Oh, I kind of know what I'm doing. Yeah, that's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so getting out of this catastrophizing, or however that you say that word, and just, like, the present. So, yeah, I think this road trip was, it was a way of, like, practicing being in the present. It's kind of a, not a forced detox, but sort of, yeah, I don't even like the word detox anymore, because, but... It was a cleanse. <laughs> uh, you know... It, it puts you in a position mm -hmm. to face the discomfort, feel it, and get past it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is amazing and rare. I mm -hmm. think that we have those opportunities. The flow state of creativity, of, of being, and seeing opportunities as they come because we're not so distracted, that takes that exact practice mm -hmm. of like, okay, putting down the shiny things and sitting. Ooh, that's uncomfortable. Shouldn't I be doing something? Shouldn't I be, right? Or I'm trying to write, got the blank page. Shouldn't I be washing the dishes right now? Or shouldn't I be doing this other thing right now? And sitting with that. And then it, it fades. The path through it is right through the middle of it versus the, the yes. detour and trying to get around it. And you sit in it and you sit in it and it gets a little easier, a little mm -hmm. easier, you go deeper, and then it's suddenly easier to focus. It's suddenly, you know, until you get pulled back out. Right? Well, and I think we did some of those exercises too, where you'd be like, yeah, I'm feeling really heavy or really, I don't remember you were saying you were sad, but I'm just looking for, like, and I'd be like, okay, so where do you, back to embodiment, where do you feel that in your body? And be like, wow, well, it's kind of in my chest, and what does it feel like? And we would like go right into it, like, what does it feel like to be there? What do you see there? What... And 
And then it's, you know, 10 minutes later, what's there now? Mm. Mm. It's kind of dissipated. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Wasn't so bad. Feeling what you're feeling. Yes. Like being there. Yes. Now. Yeah. It's, it's such a, a raw human thing to just, we're having these things and sometimes we, we need to just ex hold it and experience it to be able to let it go mm -hmm. instead of just kind of ignoring it and hoping it goes away on its own. We do stuff over here and, and, um, yeah, those are rare opportunities and ones I'm looking to create always more of in, in my own life where I can just stop and think because that's what generates the stuff that I end up doing and then eventually sharing and it's what generates everything about mm -hmm. what we're doing here. So, so well, it's I, a good thing. And I also like to say that wisdom is kind of knowing when to do which. Yeah. And again, sometimes we don't know, and so it's better to just choose something and do it versus be in the, the in-between state. So it could be like, well, I think in this moment, I just really need to be with this. And you might learn, well, you know, I really should have just gone to the doctor. <laughs> that pain in my stomach was really an ulcer. And, um, you know, just being with it wasn't such a great idea. Knowing thyself too, mm -hmm. right? I think Which comes through experiment, which comes through experience and experimentation. Mm -hmm. And probably screwing up a lot of those experiences yeah. and having and not necessarily reading it in a book, getting right. the data download. Around finding this opportunity in being and balancing it with doing and that kind of thing. Are there any particular practices, actually tiny actions or different things that show up day to day in your life that you found helpful in, in seeking that balance with work or creativity or anything like that? Meditation has been huge. The short version of this is the five minute journal, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's by Intelligent Design, I believe. I gave myself a 40 day challenge around gratitude. And then that turned into like 200 days of not breaking the chain after I broke the chain. Cause the whole idea was you had to go at least 40 days without missing a day or you had to start over. So I got to like 200 days. Well, it actually it was the conference when I saw you in Minneapolis last year, I met a couple of ladies at one of the happy hours and we got to talking about meditation. So I took a meditation challenge from one of them, which was, it was really funny. She was really into like energy stuff. And she's like, feels like for you, eight minutes would be good, but 10 minutes would be great. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I was like, oh, I'll, again, experimentation. So she's like in the morning, it, like, it'd be awesome if you did it twice a day. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do this twice a day. I did 10 minutes and I really like the insight timer app. Yeah. Um, so I did it, I've done it for a number of days. Um, and I do it at least once every day. And I find that and it's not, it's just 10 minutes. Like I play with longer amounts of time, but the, I guess the big takeaway here is there's something about just for me sitting in stillness and I'm not real picky about it. Like there's no right or way, wrong way to do it. And the reason I come back and do it and I keep doing it is I sleep better. Mm. I'm more present. I like, if I don't do it before I go to sleep, like I always, it's like, I can't, it just, it just helps to just, I think kind of slow things down up here. And I know some people are like, oh, I'm not into the whole meditation thing. I, I don't know what to say to them. Um, it works for me. Some of my like really, like really great insights have come in that kind of like not doing time of, um, oh, an idea just popped into my head of something that my son might want to do. And he's totally into it now. Like, where did that come from? Um, sometimes like certain people that like, oh, I wonder how this person's doing. And I'll just send them a quick, like, hey, I just thought of you today and wondered what, like, oh, I was just thinking of you. Like, so there's been some really kind of freaky things like that that have happened too. I have had some freaky things happen with that too, around connectedness and just the consciousness within meditation and going, just allowing those things. My best ideas come when I just sit and just let things mm -hmm. flow, let, let it go for a while. And that's been... <laughs> yeah, or that notion if like you're going to have a really, really busy day, you really do need to take some of the extra time and it will pay off. And yeah, I've even done it for like, Oh my goodness, I only have three minutes before this coaching call. It's like, well, three is better than none.
I think it's time that we do a question from the question bowl. All right. It's about that time. So these are questions starting with a bunch from us. Mm -hmm. And then each guest has left their own. Okay. So we'll see what you get. Okay. What sort of legacy are you working to create? Julie Kearns? Oh, yeah. This is an interesting question. So I, while I don't relate to the word legacy, I guess what I would say is it, it relates to what I do, which is um, sometimes I say what I do is I reduce unnecessary suffering. <laughs> so, so much of what you and I talked about and maybe some of the work we did together and the work I do with my own coach, a lot of it's just unnecessary suffering like that we're putting ourselves through. Like, so I guess the legacy that I would see myself creating would just be helping people to think, helping people to be and do differently, more effectively, to achieve and have the things that they want to have in their lives. Not, maybe not necessarily materially. Maybe it's peace or presence or, or whatever it might be. So that's how I'd answer that question. That was a great answer. And along those lines, I know that you said that you would be open and willing oh, yes. to have some conversations <laughs> yes. with anyone listening, actually. Yes. So the offer that I want to put out there to people is anyone, like anyone listening to this or watching this, if something that Anthony and I have talked about today sparked your interest and you want to talk to me, I'll have a conversation with you. I'll have a conversation with anyone. Who knows where it will lead? Um, but yeah, if something sparked your interest or you want to go deeper, you're like, wait a minute, John, I don't totally believe that. That's totally my shtick too. Like, let's have that conversation. Nice. And so if someone does want to do that, where could they find you? The best place to find me is johnpolster.com. Uh, my last name has kind of a funny spelling in that it's spelled P-O-E-L-S-T-R-A. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. And so... I, I really appreciate that offer. That's super generous and, and one that I benefited from greatly over the years. So, uh, so thank you for that. And thank you for offering that to the Break the Twitch audience. And uh, you know, I'm just really glad to have had this chance to sit down. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you.